Welcome to this video on advanced preprocessing. In this talk, I will cover some advanced preprocessing steps that we may want to apply to our fMRI data, in particular to correct for motion and physiological noise. We know that people move in the scanner. Even if they are very well behaved, they will still move a little bit. So we always need to do motion correction to realign the volumes so that the same point in the brain remains in the same coordinate over time. However, sometimes this is not enough, especially if we are dealing with children, patients, elderly people, or any participant population who may struggle to lie still in the scanner for a long time. In this case, we need additional pre-processing because motion correction does not fully correct for excessive motion. And this is because motion interacts with the physics of MRI. For example, it interacts with B0 inhomogeneities, so sudden motion can create big distortions that cannot be removed by simply realigning the volumes. Also, if a point in the brain was in a certain slice in one volume, and then because the subject moved, it ends up in a different slice in the following volume, the same point in the brain is going to be excited in a slightly different way and will give back a slightly different signal. This phenomenon is called spin history. And again, this is something that simple realignment cannot correct for. So we may want to remove or compensate for motion artifacts in some other ways. I'm going to talk to you about three options we have for additional motion correction. And the reason I give you three options is because they are based on different assumptions and they will be more appropriate for different scenarios. I'm going to highlight pros and cons of each option so that hopefully you will be able to pick the one that is most suitable for your data. There is actually a fourth option that is not listed here, which is to exclude the subject from the analysis. If they move too much, it is definitely worth trying to correct for motion, and we can combine two or more of these options together, but if the data is still too corrupted, we may need to face the fact that the data is unusable and we will need to exclude the subject. But for now, let's think positive and see how to apply these techniques. The first option is to add motion parameter confound in our single subject GLM. If you remember the FIT report, we had three plots with the three rotations and three translations over time that were measured during the realignment step uh, with MacFlirt. With a simple button in FIT, we can add them as confound regressors in our GLM. And if the data can be explained by a linear combination of the motion parameters, then the effect is going to be explained by those regressors and it's not going to end up in our contrast of interest. I said linear combination, so this is also a disadvantage because it assumes that there is a linear relationship between motion parameters and the effect they have on their data. So it assumes that if a subject moved a certain amount between two volumes, and double the amount between other two volumes, then the effect on the signal will be double, which is an approximation because the interaction between motion and the physics of MRI is more complex than that. However, this is usually still a very common and effective way to correct for motion. It is also possible to include squared parameters to model some non-linearities. However, this is at the expense of increasing the number of regressors and reducing the degrees of freedom and so the statistical power. This approach also assumes that the estimation of motion parameters is accurate because we use the output of MacFlirt as regressors. A particular scenario where this technique is problematic is when motion is highly correlated with our task. So motion parameters will be correlated with our EVs of interest. An example of stimulus correlated motion is when a subject moves their head every time they press a button. In this case, there is no way to distinguish the signal due to motion from the signal due to the stimulus. And everything that can be explained by the motion confounds will not end up in our contrast of interest and we will lose activation. However, this is not a problem of this technique. It's just not possible to distinguish the contribution of correlated EVs. So think carefully about your study and your study design to avoid this situation. 
For example, in the word generation and word shadowing experiment that we saw in the practical, we asked the subjects to think about the words and not to speak out loud, so we could minimize the motion related to the task. The second option is to detect motion outliers. This is very useful when we have sudden motion, because this approach is based on the fact that big jumps will cause big changes in intensity. It doesn't rely on the motion parameters, but on intensity changes. So we have a tool called FSL Motion Outliers, which for each volume calculates the average intensity, and if the change in intensity is higher than a certain threshold that we decide, then the volume is going to be flagged as an outlier and its effect will be removed from the data. I said its effect is going to be removed from the data, not the volume itself. So you may have heard of a technique called scrubbing, which is a cleaning technique that consists in removing completely from the data the volumes that are too affected by motion. We don't do that because it can be a problem in further analysis and, for example, it interferes with temporal autocorrelation in the signal. What we do instead is to add an additional EV in our design matrix with zero everywhere and one in correspondence of the outlier time point, so that all the variance explained by that volume is going to be soaked up by that EV and will not end up in our contrast of interest. And we do the same for each outlier detected by the tool we add one EV for each outlier. The reason why we do this and not add one EV with all the outliers is because we don't want to assume that all the outliers will have the same effect on the data. One outlier might be just above threshold and not have a big impact on the signal. On the other hand, another one could be way above threshold and have a much bigger influence on the data. So we want to model them separately. They will have different parameter estimates and so that we can weigh them appropriately. The good thing about this option is that it doesn't assume linearity. It doesn't rely on McFlirt estimation and it's very effective to remove big excessive motion. The downside of it is that it doesn't correct for small amounts of motion. So anything below the threshold is not corrected at all. So we can still combine uh, this technique with this previous method to correct both small and big motion effects, but this means adding more EVs, losing degrees of freedom and reducing statistical power. Another problem is if we have a lot of outliers to model, either because the threshold is too low or simply because the subject moved a lot. Also in this case, we will have a lot of additional regressors, potentially reducing statistical power. And finally, the third option is independent component analysis. This is a technique that it's mostly used in resting state fMRI, so you will hear more about ICA in the resting state lecture. I'm briefly mentioning it here because it's used as additional pre-processing step for artifact removal. Essentially, ICA decomposes the data into a set of components which explain interesting structure in the data so they can be related to either neuronal signal or to noise. Each component will have a spatial map and a time series associated with it, and by looking at these two elements, we can identify which components are related to noise and remove their contribution from the data. The power of this approach is that it does not only allow detecting noise related to motion, but also other types of noise, like physiological noise or MRI-related artifacts. Also, in this case, there is a trade-off. So the downside of it is the fact that it requires more effort. We need to run ICA, then we need to identify the noisy components, either manually or with semi-automated or automated tools, and then we need to remove the contribution of the noisy components out of the data. And we will see all these steps uh, in the resting state lectures. These are just a few examples of noise components that we can get from ICA. The top row shows noise components that are related to motion, with the first one being the classic motion artifact, with a special pattern that looks like a ring around the brain. And this is because when we move, uh, these voxels 
will move between inside and outside of the brain. So the change in intensity is very big and shows up in components like this. The second is due to the interaction between motion and multiband acquisition. So if we are acquiring multiple slices at the same time, the motion will affect the slices that were acquired when motion occurred. And we can see the effect as stripes in the spatial map. And the third one is due to the interaction between motion and susceptibility. And as you can see, the areas that are more affected are those that suffer from distortions and dropouts. The second row uh, shows other sources of noise, in particular physiological noise. The first one, uh, we called it a white matter component because the spatial pattern is localized in the white matter. It's actually probably more caused by the microvasculature of the white matter. The one in the middle shows signal from the sagittal sinus, so an example of signal from the veins that we can detect. And the last one is related to cardiac pulsation and CSF pulsation. And the signal is localized in this case in the ventricles and in the arteries. Uh, as you can see here in the circle of Willis. So these were three options for motion correction, with the last one including other sources of noise, including physiological noise. I'm now moving on to talk specifically about physiological noise correction. So while our participants are in their scanner, hopefully they breathe and their heart beats. However, this has an effect on the both signal that we acquire. It will affect different areas in different ways, but in particular, if we are studying the brainstem, other areas at the base of the brain or the spinal cord, then correcting for physiological noise becomes quite important. We could use ICA and estimate the physiological noise from the data, but we can actually measure the cardiac and respiratory cycles directly during acquisition, and then use this information to clean the data with a tool called PNM. To do this, we would need, for example, a respiratory bellow to measure the respiratory trace, and we can use a pulse oximeter to measure the heart rate. What we also need is a record of the scanner triggers, because we need to know at which point of the breathing and cardiac cycles our images were acquired. Here is a slide to show you the location of the cardiac and respiratory effects. Cardiac effects usually are concentrated at the base of the brain, near the main vessels and the areas of the CSF pulsatility, while the respiratory effects are more widespread, and they are mainly due to two main phenomena. The first is the fact that the lung volume changes during breathing, and the flow of air in and out changes the B0 field, with biggest effects in inferior areas and near the edges of the brain. The second is the change of oxygenation of the blood during the respiratory cycle, which obviously causes a change in the bold signal throughout the gray matter. Here is how to correct for physiological noise with PNM. It requires the physiological recordings as input stored in a text file. We then need to tell PNM which column contains the cardiac trace, the respiratory trace, and the scanner triggers. In this example, columns number four, two, and three. We also need to give PNM the slice order, so the order in which the slices are acquired during the volume. And so different slices will be acquired during different phases of the cardiac and respiratory cycles, so we need to take that into account. The first thing that PNM does is to detect the peaks of the physiological traces and show them to us in a web interface. We then need to check them and we can edit them if necessary. Then it's going to create some Fourier series, some sinusoidal waves that are centered around this, these peaks and they are used to model our physiological traces. We can set the order of the harmonics, so the complexity of the waves, and the higher the order, the better the fit to the trace will be but also the higher the number of additional EVs will be produced and we will have less degrees of freedom. We can also set interactions between the respiratory and cardiac cycles. For example, it is plausible to assume that the heart will beat at different rates during the breathing cycle. At the bottom, 
uh, you can also select other additional EVs, like the respiratory volume per time, which is related to the oxygenation of the blood, the heart rate and the CSF mean signal. And the latter is the only one that is not derived from the recording, but from the data itself. This is the output. So you can see that PNM generates a lot of regressors. Because different slices are acquired at different times, uh, we are going to have different sets of regressors for different slices, and they will be stored as images. So we need to add them as voxel-wise confounds in our first level GLM in feed. You are not going to see them explicitly like here when you set up your design matrix, but this is what happens to your design matrix when you add these regressors. Here is an example of the effect of using PNM. These are some preliminary data from a pain study where the results in blue were obtained without correcting for physiological noise and the ones in orange were obtained after using PNM. The green areas are those that overlap between the two. As you can see, we can rescue some activation at the base of the brain and in the brainstem when using PNM. So to conclude, we have seen three options for motion artifact correction, namely adding motion parameters as confound EVs, detecting motion outliers and including them as additional EVs, and using ICA-based cleaning. For physiological noise correction, we have seen a data-driven approach, the ICA-based cleaning, and one which requires physiological recordings, physiological noise modeling, and the use of voxel-wise confound EVs.